for a beautiful day, beautiful park, uh, the freedom that we have in the United States to worship you outdoors. Uh, many of our brothers and sisters around the world have to be underground. Uh, the fear of persecution, uh, the reality of persecution is a, a real one. And uh, it sobers us about uh, our freedoms that we have being here in the United States. God, we pray that uh, you would continue to go before us, that you would uh, be pleased with our worship towards you, that we could clear our minds and our hearts and our souls of any distractions and be able to focus in on you, Jesus, and to know that uh, you are our all, uh, that you are our provision, that you are our refuge, you're our shelter. Pray for many of us who are dealing with, all of us dealing with uh, COVID, that you keep us protected and safe. Pray for those of us that have lost loved ones and friends that we know have, uh, that we can be the support to them uh, as they go through this grieving process. And any other of our brothers and sisters or family members or extended family members that are dealing with illnesses or sickness or those that have passed away, that they could feel your comfort only as you could give it. We love you. We thank you. Sing your sons and we pray. Amen. And so uh, for those of you that are visiting, just to kind of give you an update, uh, we just started worshiping outside together. And so this is like our fourth or fifth service for the summer, and it's been great. Uh, we will be moving on the inside uh, back at our uh, place of worship at Bridgewater in September. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, but yesterday, uh, I was asked to do benediction and a prayer uh, for Caleb. And Caleb's going to come up here in a minute. Uh, and I was asked to do this benediction for uh, honoring an Eagle Scout. So now I will confess, I never got past being a Cub Scout. But uh, to give you an idea of this honor, I want to make sure I get this right. There are over 2.2 million Boy Scouts in the United States alone. Less than 8% become Eagle Scouts. And so yesterday was an opportunity to honor Caleb. And I thought I would ask Caleb, he did his pledge as an Eagle Scout for the first time yesterday. And so I wanted him to come up here and do it for the second time today. And so Caleb, if you would come on up. And bear with him. He's just now become an Eagle Scout. He's not 24 hours in yet. And so he's still getting his pledge down. But one of the other things I wanted to mention, Caleb started as a Cub Scout at 9 to 10 years of age. It has taken nearly 10 years to become an Eagle Scout. In the midst of that, COVID, fight for social justice, and Caleb also lost his father. And so... I think Caleb exemplifies a lot of the characteristics that Jesus calls us to have in him. So if you would welcome Caleb and he's gonna recite his ego play for yes. us. So like he said, my name is Caleb. I've been an Eagle Scout for a little less than 24 hours as of 2.30 yesterday. Um, and yeah, my pledge, so the point of an Eagle Scout is not necessarily the goal of Boy Scouts. It's more so a goal of life, if that makes sense. You want to be able to help people and do things for as long as you live because you know you can. And so I'm going to go ahead and start reading this. It says, I reaffirm my allegiance to the three promises of the Scout Oath. I thoughtfully recognize and take upon myself the obligations and responsibilities of an Eagle Scout. On my honor, I will do my best to make my training an example, my rank and my influence count strongly for better scouting and for better citizenship in my troop, in my community, and in my contacts with other people. To this, I pledge my sacred honor. And I had to say that for the first time yesterday in front of so many people. <laughs> never hearing it before. But the thing that helped was I didn't say it alone. 
because when that is said, other Eagle Scouts are supposed to always stand and say it with you. So I was able to say it because I knew I had my Eagle brothers with me. So. So uh, there were a few of us there uh, to celebrate and Lorraine had asked us to come. And, and so it was just a, a great, great time together. Uh, as you would imagine, obviously Caleb didn't get to this point alone. And there were a number of mentors that got him to that point. But at one juncture during the ceremony, uh, Caleb has to give them pins for just honoring them in terms of helping him to become an Eagle Scout. And so as he's getting the pins together, he tells them, if you would come over here and get in line. And I thought that Caleb probably got a little bit of kick out of telling his superiors to get in line and do what I tell you to do. And so uh, it was a great, great time yesterday. I, one of the things I, I learned yesterday is that so much of the aspects of an Eagle Scout are so parallel to being a disciple of Jesus. And in short, it's a life of self-denial. And uh, during the ceremony, uh, they, they had a video of Caleb from when he was just a little boy all the way to when he becomes a man, young man. And uh, I mentioned yesterday that because of COVID, uh, we weren't meeting face to face for about you know a year plus. And so we hadn't seen each other physically. And so our first service together, I saw Caleb in a, over a year. And when I last saw Caleb, you know, he was coming along as a young man developing. When I saw him about four or five weeks ago, I told the crowd yesterday, his chest was out. He's a little bit taller than me now. And uh, he's not a little boy. And he's a, he's a grown, young, grown man now. And so uh, with that being said, what I closed out with for the benediction was in Philippians 4. And in verse eight, the Bible reads, finally brothers, whatever is true and whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And I thought, man, becoming an Eagle Scout certainly reflects that. And it's interesting to me in so many positive, realms of life, athletics, becoming an Eagle Scout, a successful CEO, somebody that's a janitor, a teacher, that when you are trying to give your best and be excellent and do what is praiseworthy, those are all aspects of Jesus, aren't they? And, uh, and so it was a great time uh, to be together. Uh, this morning, I want to do part two of uh, what I started on Wednesday nights. We have our midweek classes and uh, we looked at Jesus' relationship with Judas. Now, you know, Judas is a bad word in our society. When you think someone has betrayed you, maybe you've said it, maybe you've heard it said, it's a line in a movie and it goes, that Judas. And yet, um, I realized as I started studying this out that, wow, how much Jesus loved Judas. And you don't really, at least not me, I don't really hear that part. Know that he betrayed him. Know that he hung himself. Know that he sold Jesus out. All that. But you don't hear a lot about how Jesus loved Judas. In fact, when you read the scriptures about Jesus' relationship with Judas, it really is challenging to my faith. And so to do a little bit of a review, uh, the lesson is about, man, how do you function with people that are toxic? Right? When we have the opportunity to walk away from people that are toxic, I don't know about you, but I try to walk away. I try to do it fairly quickly. 
But many of us, by a show of hands, how many of you work with one or a couple or have a family member or a close family member that is toxic or has some toxic tendencies? Right. And we can't walk away, right? When the family dinner, family reunion comes, Christmas comes, Uncle Benny's going to be there. And Uncle Benny is Uncle Benny. And so you try to navigate your way around the family reunion or the Thanksgiving dinner. But ultimately, you know, and Uncle Benny knows that he's going to say hi to you. And so you try to brace yourself for that moment of exchanging that conversation. Or if we're at work, there are individuals that you cannot walk away from. In fact, some of those individuals may be your boss. And if you walk away from your boss, you walk away from earning your living. And so in many other areas, there are people we have to work with. We, we don't have an option. For some of us, we grew up in some very toxic households. Even unfortunately, our mothers or our fathers or people very dear to us, our siblings, and we weren't able to walk away. And because we weren't able to walk away, that has shaped us to some degree or another. And so I wanted us to look at how Jesus navigated this relationship because saying the word relationship and toxic don't seem to go together, but they do. And so as a quick review, one of the things that was brought out is there's about 10 qualities that reflect a toxic individual. Number one, they always blame you for everything wrong. Show of hands, you ever been around somebody like that? Never, ever, 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 ever their fault. Even when they try to say sorry, they can't say the whole word. Uh, I'm probably dating myself here, but there was a show called Happy Days when I was growing up. And one of the main characters, his name was Fonzie. And Fonzie was a motorcycle rider. Actually, it's funny. I was just talking to Jesse because Jesse likes to ride his motorcycle to be able to unwind. And Fonzie in this episode or this uh, sitcom was a motorcycle rider and it depicts the 50s. And whenever Fonzie did something wrong and it came to him having to say he was sorry, it would go something like, I'm sir, I'm sir, I'm sir. And they say, I know Fonzie. There are some people that never do anything wrong and they always blame you for everything. Number two. They never admit their mistakes. Never say that they made some mistakes, that they messed up, that, you know, I could have done this better. Number three, they disregard your boundaries. I was talking to one of my daughters and uh, she's finishing up her master's and she's going to start her doctorate in January. And uh, she, by the grace of God, has done exceptionally well. And uh, she has done so well that uh, her uh, professor asked her to do research and she was published as a first year master's student. Anyway, long story short, uh, her professor has really been pressing her. And my daughter has to do uh, work at Grady Hospital for part of her master's. Uh, she's writing her thesis, so forth and so on. And uh, she just busted into uh, where my daughter was, pre was preparing for a presentation and started talking to her for about what seemed maybe like seven or 10 minutes. And it really shook my daughter up. And if you've ever had to go to someone and talk to them and they're your superior about how they made you feel, particularly if you're a young individual, that is overwhelmingly intimidating, but she was able to do it. And she went over her professor's head, talked to the administrator and everything worked out. But the administrator or rather the professor didn't respect her boundaries. People that are toxic disregard your boundaries. 
They are dishonest individuals that are toxic. Obviously, as I'm going through these characteristics, we can certainly see that with Judas. Number five, they play the victim. When, when, when anything gets so difficult, then it's, man, everybody's picking on me. Uh, oh, you don't understand my situation. Uh, you know, all of a sudden, you know, feel sorry for me. Number six, they invalidate your feelings. You're trying to express yourself and they tell you in so many words, what you're feeling is wrong. Get over it. Number seven, they don't listen to you. They hear you, but they don't listen to you. Number eight, they are harsh towards others. How many of you have ever been around a harsh person? How many of you have ever been told, you don't have to raise your hand for this one, that you were harsh? I appreciate the few, the proud, the brave that raised their hand. Number nine, they make you question your sanity. You ever been around somebody like that? Like, man, maybe it's me. Like, you know, you're trying to talk to them and their toxicity is all over the place. And after a while of listening to them, you think, well, maybe, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's me. Uh, Number 10, they are inconsistent, can't rely on. Their yes isn't their yes, their no isn't their no. And number 11, they're just selfish. They're, just, they're selfish people. And so I wanna pick up on Jesus's relationship with Judas and how Jesus didn't let Judas's toxicity become his. Isn't that challenging? Like when somebody's toxic, don't you just want to get a little toxic too? I know I like, you know what? Let me let you feel how you make me feel. But we're not always in that position and probably not the best thing to do anyway. So how much money would you spend to get an hour to ask Jesus all the questions you ever want to ask. How much money, would, some of us don't have much anyway, so you're like, hey, yeah, this is, this is a deal. But man, to, to be able to go up to Jesus, perfection incarnate, and ask him whatever questions you want to ask him. And maybe we've asked those questions to Jesus in the last year and a half plus. Why is this pandemic on? God, how long is this going to take place? Why is this all this upheaval with social justice going on? Why, why did my relative have to be? A lot of questions we probably have just in the last year and a half, let alone for as long as we've been living. But if you had the opportunity, how much money would you spend? What would it be worth to you to go back to the first century and spend an entire weekend with Jesus. Entire weekend, just you and Jesus, no interruptions, just you and him hanging out. Watching him perform miracles, listening to his teachings, participating in private conversations, watching him pray and interact with others. You think that'd be worth it? You know, like, how does perfection pray? How does complete in an innocence interact with those that are not innocent? How does the one who controls everything not try to control everything? Like, power is a big deal for human beings. I remember one time uh, I was listening to something about Michael Jordan. And he was going through his divorce with his wife, Juanita. And I was having a conversation with someone. And I said, man, why, 
why did she stay in that relationship so long? Oh, I think I was looking at some sports. And because worth nearly a billion back then, so she get close to 400 million. Why, why stay in that relationship? She knows what he's doing. She knows how he's behaving. He's the most famous man on the planet. Because when she walks into a restaurant, they don't say, there goes Juanita. They said, there goes Miss Joy. Power means a lot to us, more than money. And so how would perfection handle power? You know, I'm guessing we would offer a whole lot to spend a weekend with Jesus. I'm guessing that whatever amount of time, money, energy we would need to give, just to see, you may not even want to become a follower, but it's just kind of like uh, this team that you heard is real good, or this area that you want to purchase a home is beautiful, or this vacation spot that you think has been told is just amazing. I just want to go check it out. I just want to, I want to check it out. Kind of like flying to the moon. Right? How many of you hope that in your lifetime, the prices will lower just a little bit from 250000 to fly to the moon? Just because I just want to check it out. You won't see me. Not because, well, not only because I'm scared. I, I don't have that kind of money. But anyway, ministers don't get paid that much. So, so I, but I guess we would pay a whole lot. All of this, 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 to spend a weekend with Jesus, to be around perfection. How would he interact? How would he be with people? How would he pray? How would he do his miracles? Personal time. All of that makes Judas' betrayal seem all the more ungrateful. My daughters, I have four daughters. I have a shirt. I was going to wear it today, but it was too tight. And so I couldn't do that. You know, quarantine has expanded me a little bit. And, but my, my shirt says something to the effect of, I have four daughters. I'm not afraid of you. <laughs> and so uh, one of the things my kids know is I can't stand ingratitude. Like, I just, I just. Don't like it. I remember one time I was a teenager coming in the house. And uh, I walked in the house and I didn't say hello. And my dad, with a very stern tone, said, Man, speak when you come in the house. Like, I'd never walked in my home again and didn't say hello. I got, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't like ingratitude, but it all the more makes Judas' betrayal seem more ungrateful. Jesus gave him a front row seat to the most significant life ever lived and Jesus, Judas sold him out. Now, I've learned over the years of Jesus walking with me and me making my best attempt through his power to walk with him. Uh, I've had Judas moments with Jesus. I've, I've sold Jesus out. Opportunities to share my faith, I just said no. Opportunities to make sacrifice and lay down my life, try to love somebody that is toxic. I said, I'm not. And so I'm, I'm learning as I get older. Uh, you, you probably can find yourself somewhere in Judas. You can find yourself somewhere in the parts of God's story from Genesis to Revelation where you fall short. So anyway, he sold him out. And yet at the Last Supper, when Jesus washed his disciples' feet, Jesus made sure that Judas was still present. Made sure. It wasn't like, hey, you know, let's have the Last Supper. Oh, Judas isn't here. What happened? Like, it's only 12. But he still could have done that, right? But you guys forgot to tell Judas? I, 
I forgot to tell him we were going to have to suffer. No. Could have kicked him out of the club. He didn't. Didn't kick him out of the club. Even in face of ungratefulness and malice, Jesus kept the door open to relational reconciliation. Isn't that difficult? When uh, people are toxic, to want to reconcile with them. People that you can't get away from, like if you got a sibling, like you can't un undo your sister. Like you can't say she's not my sister. Uh, you got a brother, you can't say he's not my brother. You got a parent, you can't say they're not my dad. You could say it, but I mean, proof is in the pudding. When you go check your birth certificate, it's going to say your dad's mom's name. That's difficult, isn't it? Jesus was, he loved Jesus, loved him, didn't love him any less than any of the other 11. Like, I'm asking God to increase my faith about loving others that are difficult, that you can't walk away from. You ever, you ever pray for God to take somebody out of your life? Not kill them. I'm not saying kill them. I, 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 and I'm not even saying injure them. They, 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 they just, uh, something would happen and they, they just would be gone. You would come into your home or, or work or and you say, man, where is so-and-so? Oh, they left. Oh, when did they come back? Oh, they're not coming back. Oh, God, thank you so much. Right. And so Jesus made sure that Judas was present at the Last Supper. Even in the midst of ungratefulness and malice, he kept the door open for relational reconciliation. In other words, it wasn't going to be on Jesus whether or not Judas wanted to reconcile. It was going to be on Judas. Like uh, at work, some of your employees say, What? There's an open door policy. Why do they say that? Because if you got some issue, you're not going to be able to say, well, you know, I didn't want to interrupt you. Your door was closed. <laughs> Doors always open. Don't you love that about Jesus? He leaves the door open for Judas. Even in his ingratitude, even in his malice, even knowing that Jesus was going to be betrayed and murdered by the very man that he gave his life to for three years. Walk with him every day. Jesus made a decision. He's going to love Judas to the end. Have you ever... Uh, met someone or known of someone that has come to the end of their life and they didn't reconcile a relationship and they wish they would have. It's interesting when you're at the end of your life, all that toxicity, that anger, that frustration, that ingratitude, that, that bitterness that one holds, it's something about being on your deathbed that it really doesn't matter. Being at the end of your life. That's amazing to me. How all the stuff we deal with in our life, all that comes our way, highs and lows. And with those individuals that are toxic, when you're on your last days, hours, minutes, it doesn't matter. That's interesting to me. And so Jesus made up his mind, you can't make me hate you. Your toxicity won't become my toxicity. Anybody ever put on somebody else's toxicity? <laughs> I have. I put it on like a jacket, like a suit. You're going to act that way 
with me, I'm gonna act that way with you. Maybe not the whole suit, maybe the jacket, the pants, some socks. Isn't it interesting, Matthew 26, 50. I've read this for 37 years, nearly 40 years. Do what you came for, friend. Even saying that to you, I've been preaching for 37 years. Uh, that friend part. Like, really? <laughs> I mean, I think about my friends. They're not toxic. I love being around. They refresh me. I refresh them. I, I, I go to them for as a refuge. That I don't I don't see and I don't have friends like that. Maybe you do. Isn't that an upper call, man? I mean, and yet I, if you're like you, if you're like me. Rather than friend, how about skunk? Or how about snake? Jesus said friend because he didn't have a toxic molecule in his body. There was nowhere for toxicity to take root. You know, God's love for us is so ridiculously radical. It, it's it, it can only be done through faith. He wants everyone to come to a knowledge of the truth. First Timothy 2, 4 tells us that. He, he wants everybody to at least know, to at least know what he has to offer, whether they decide to give their life to him or not. And as followers of his, we also must be for everyone, even if we oppose what they're doing. If we must, don't treat them as they treat us. We don't offer evil in exchange for evil. We love, we serve, we guard our hearts so that we are not poisoned by their bad example. Turn over to Proverbs. Oh. Proverbs chapter four. Verse 23, keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flow the springs of life. I remember one time uh, I let some people and individuals, I took on their toxic, toxicity. And uh, my wife and I were, were exercising together. And this was years ago. And I said, man, I, I am just, my springs of life. I just wasn't encouraging. I, I wasn't smiling. I, I wasn't just going and engaging people. And I said, man, I, I don't like this. I don't like feeling like this. And in short, my, my wife said, you, their toxicity has become yours, sweetheart. You, you need to repent of that. You need to let that go. It's, it's destroying you. Isn't that the interesting thing? When we don't leave the door open to our hearts, when people are toxic, it hurts us more than them because hurt people hurt people. But man, how do I guard my heart? How do I guard my heart with all vigilance and yet still go after growing, trying to love like that? It's not humanly possible. <laughs> it's, it's going to take looking at Jesus' life and just trusting that God will give you the strength to be able to do that. 
that these promises are true. When the Bible talks about compassion and, and kindness and, and these fruits of the spirit, like, do I, I really have the power to be able to love like that? And yeah, we've seen it all the time, right? We see it all the time. I mean, wasn't that was that was so amazing about Nelson Mandela? Thrown in jail unjustly for 20 years and unites a racist nation. Had those who threw him in jail over for dinner and was able to work with them and have a democratic society. Do you think that was Nelson in and of himself or do you think that was the Lord? Mother Teresa, just giving to the poor. Those are faithful fruits. Those are fruits that we can't exhibit in and of ourselves. But man, would you agree with me? If ever the world has been toxic, it's not. And the world needs us. They don't need us to judge them by why they wear a mask or why they don't wear a mask or why they got a shot or why they didn't get a shot or why kids or why that or mandate or who's black or who's white. They just need to see somebody that's not toxic. That somebody's not responding. You ever, uh, you ever had a conversation with someone and they were really angry with you and you just sat and listened and you didn't react and they heard themselves and they said, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I know I may be being a little harsh here, a little mean. Anybody have experienced that? I have. It's amazing when we bear the fruits of Jesus, how it disarms people. And so as we get ready to partake of the emblems, that represent Jesus' body and blood. Man, one, I pray that we're just so thankful to be saved. Like, I don't know about you, oftentimes I thank God for my salvation based off when he saved me. But Shannon and I, as we were coming to the park this morning, we were praying, and I thought, man, God, thank you for saving me because I don't, I don't have any idea what I would be like at 57? Like, I would be a mess. Like, it's one thing, I was 21. But to add 30 more plus years onto that, that was already messed up. And I know for me, man, I still don't grasp what's waiting for me. I still don't grasp how wonderful of a relationship I have. And that's okay, because of God's grace, it makes it exciting. It enables me to fall more and more in love with Jesus. Let's go to the Father first. Uh, God, we, uh, we know that without you, we're, we're no better than Judas. We, are, uh, we can become toxic. And yet, Jesus, we thank you that you didn't let Judas's toxicity become yours. Uh, you're such a higher calling to us, and yet uh, you do leave us your Holy Spirit. You do tell us by faith that we have the same power that raised you from the dead that lives inside of us. If we're willing, you'll enable us to have the doors of our heart open to reconciling and helping and being a light to the world and with each other. We love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.